Hi, this is Dan Cotter, President of the Chicago Bar Association. We're here today to speak on the topic of LGBT and the law in the UK and the US. And we have two of the foremost experts in the field uh, with us today to explore this topic. Uh, to my right is Darcy Chemnitz. Yep. Uh, Darcy brings more than two decades of nonprofit <laughs> and social justice experience to her role as the LGBT Bar's Executive Director. Under her leadership, the bar has become the largest and most recognized organization of LGBT legal professionals in the country. In addition to orchestrating a coalition of more than 25 local, state, and regional LGBT bar associations and dozens of LGBT law student associations, Darcy has overseen the annual Lavender Law Conference and Career Fair with thousands of attendees each year. Darcy is a frequently quoted expert on LGBT legal issues appearing in media outlets, including the ABA Journal, ABC News, Time Magazine, and others. She's a distinguished graduate of the University of Wisconsin and the Hamlin University School of Law. Welcome, Darcy. Thank you. And to my immediate right is Daniel Winterfeld. Daniel is head of international capital markets at CMS and a US securities lawyer with over 14 years of experience in London and New York. His practice focuses on representing US UK, European and Asian investment banks, and corporate issuers in a wide range of securities transactions, including Rule 144A and Regulation S, equity and debt offerings. Regulation S, Category 3 transactions for U.S. companies listed in the United Kingdom, rights offer offerings, exchange offers, equity-linked securities offerings, and other SEC work. Daniel is the founder and co-chair of the Forum for U.S. Securities Lawyers in London, a trade association representing over 1,500 U.S. qualified lawyers and market participants from law firms and financial institutions in the London capital markets. He is also the diversity and inclusion partner for CMS and the founder and co-chair of the Interlaw Diversity Forum. Welcome, Daniel. Thank you. So why don't we get started? Uh, Darcy, why don't you tell us about the originations of the LGBT bar and uh, how that came together. Sure. In uh, the late 1980s, we were in a situation with HIV AIDS in this country that the president wasn't even saying the word. And if people can remember there was a march on Washington in 1987, and a handful of lawyers got together at that march um, specifically with the idea of trying to share resources and develop some standards of practice within the profession. Um, several years later, um, we became part of the American Bar Association in 1993 over a very um, hard-fought contest on the House floor of whether or not we would even be allowed uh, in the ABA. Uh, to say that we were not welcomed with open arms back in that day is an accurate state, although certainly things have changed much since then. Um, I started volunteering for the group in the late 1990s, and in 2001 we had our first career fair. And that's when we became known to Big Law, which are the MLA 200 law firms. Um, and uh, in 2004, I became the first executive director. We're now just about a $2 million a year group with five full-time staffers. Um, this last event we had at Lavender Law, which Mr. Um, Winterfeld was an esteemed speaker, we had 1,647 attendees, over um, 190 entities recruiting for LGBT law students, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of law students. And so we feel we can move that needle and help build community by being a, a, a mini bar association specifically by, for, and about LGBT lawyers and law students. Great. And Daniel, could you tell us a little bit about Interlaw and how it came together? Sure. Um, I, um, I'm, as we talked about, I'm, in, I'm a New York qualified lawyer. I started my career on Wall Street. I moved to the London market in 2000. Um, when I moved to London, both the firms, I worked at one firm for five years, another firm for three years. At both of those firms, for most of the time I was there, I was the only out lawyer. Um, it was very isolating. There weren't diversity networks. There were um, uh, almost no firms monitored LGBT um, uh, strands, you know, at the Strand um, as part of their you know, HR policies. It was um, a very different world from New York that I had worked in for two years where there were domestic partners, there were visible out LGBT people within the profession. I knew no LGBT partners. Um, there just was kind of, it was very strange. My private life and, and my professional life were very separate. And um, I saw an article, um, I think about 
eight years ago that was on the cover of The Lawyer. So there are two big legal publications in the UK, The Lawyer and Legal Week, and um, JP Morgan, so um, someone named Tim Hales, who's become um, really a mentor and um, a, a good friend of mine, who's a managing director at JP Morgan, was on the cover of The Lawyer saying JP Morgan tells law firms to shape up on gay issues. Uh, they pulled in their top 10 billing law firms. They made the senior partner, managing partner, spend a half day with Stonewall, the leading LGB equality, soon to be LGBT equality charity in the UK. Um, and um, that was really a big moment because I really, it's the first time I really saw my work life and LGBT kind of coming together. I realized there was really something missing. I changed firms. I started going to um, Stonewall's um, to kind of quarterly briefings for the diversity champions. And um, the legal sector in their work quality index, which is like the HRC index, um, but a little bit more competitive. Nobody gets 100, and there's this constant race, and they publish the top 100 employers. Well, at that point, there were no law firms in the top 100, and the legal sector was second from the bottom, just above healthcare. So I realized there was more of an issue that was not just personal for me, but it was a sector-wide issue that not only were um, was there a problem you know, with just, I think, visibility, but there was also a real problem with the fundamentals of equality and with, with best practice in the legal sector. And I thought, well, we're not gonna change this by me working with my firm and making it the best place. Um, really, it was a sector-wide issue, and I'd been running the forum for US Securities Lawyers. I sort of knew how to bring firms and in-house counsel together, so I um, set about you know, launching Interlaw, thinking it would be start very small and sort of grow the way my US Lawyers group, which started with seven people around a table <laughs> from five law firms. Well, guess what? People were about more interested and LGBT equality. So the very first meeting, we had Tim Hale speak from JP Morgan. We had Ben Summerskill, who was the chief executive of Stonewall, and we had over 120 people sign up. Um, and about 75 people came from 30 law firms to the first meeting. And we did a big launch event at the National Portrait Gallery where over 300 people came from all across the city. So it started with a bang. We do monthly meetings. We do um, research and, and work with the, with the government. We, um, we do um, charitable work. We've raised over 250,000 pounds for the Albert Kennedy Trust, who work with homeless and at-risk LGBT youth. So quite a wide range of activities. Um, so it's a very different origin, and in a way kind of a different organization from the bar, but this, from the LGBT bar, but, but in a way um, comp very complementary. So. And, and you, you've talked about uh, early in your career and whatnot, and, and not knowing anybody when you went over to London uh, that was out. Uh, you know, what are some of the most successful ways that leaders and firms have combated the discrimination against LGBT for both of you? Go ahead, Danny. Okay. Um, well, look, I think I think that you know visible leadership is really important. I think you know I think as Darcy kind of referenced when you know people started marching in Washington in 1987 when the president couldn't articulate or say the word HIV or AIDS. You know the same is true about LGBT. I think for a long time people couldn't say the word gay in a room. They couldn't be visible and I think that's probably one of the biggest things people can do to just make it not something that's unusual, not something that's strange, don't trip over the word, know how to use it, be open about being inclusive um, around all strands of diversity but with LGBT in particular it's say it. And I think it's difficult, um, you know, I can imagine a situation with somebody say older um, would hear the comment, I'm a lesbian lawyer, and hear that as an inappropriate discussion of sexual activity in the workplace, rather than an identity. But I'm a lesbian lawyer is an identity. It isn't just a discussion of sexual activity. And I think that that's kind of the linchpin and the change between the generations. Um, and obviously a bias or animus against LGBT legal professionals is a generational problem then the solution is going to lie within the next generation, which is why we at the LGBT bar put so many of our resources within um, the law students and, and try to help them come out earlier and more often. And I think um, as, as far as how to talk about it, um, Eric Holder once said that the US is a nation of cowards when it comes to discussion of race. Um, certainly we are when it comes to a discussion of LGBT issues. So I encourage people to kind of accept the fact they may not get it right the first time around. I'm not going to say you're going to fail talking about it, but you may not get it the way you want it, the perfect, but you do have to ask. And I think coming to a, a conversation with a true compassionate curiosity will give people rewards, and that will help us all learn how to talk about it a little bit. Sure. 
And, and uh, I would imagine that finding data on LGBT lawyers and law firms is difficult. So how would you suggest uh, that the, the profession go about mm -hmm. uh, gathering some of that data? It's a constant problem. The National Association for Law Placement asks, um, they used to have the term openly gay and have for many years, asked how many openly gay um, lawyers of counsel or um, partners or associates were in their firms. And we would find that firms just simply didn't want to ask and people didn't want to say. I mean, people want to be known for their excellence in their work product. They want to be known for what they can do as lawyers. They may not want to be that gay lawyer. Um, but one way of getting folks to come out within the legal profession is celebrating Pride Month, um, bringing straight allies together. Um, you'll find that there's going to be a lot of um, uh, lawyers and associates and law students whose parents came out late in life, or there will be proud people like mom and dads. Um, and just kind of approaching it from a very holistic view, I think, is the way that you get people to, to come out. And I know the National Association for Law Placement has been encouraging firms, um, even if they're not getting anyone within their firm coming out, to put a zero um, on that metric box. So at least we know that they've been asking, and that's what we're hoping for. Yeah, in the UK it's a little bit different because from monitoring, I spent years talking to law firms saying you can monitor, you can ask people if they're LGBT. You know, best practice is always to have people to have declined to answer, but they used to ask all the other questions for all the other strands of diversity and leave LGBT off. Mm -hmm. And they said, oh, well, it's a private matter. We don't think we should ask. It's like, well, that's why declined to answer is there. Mm -hmm. If someone thinks it's private, they don't have to tell you. But by not asking, you're sending a signal. Mm -hmm. um, but now the SRA has come along, the Solicitor's Regulatory Authority, and they have required now that firms monitor sexual orientation. So. <clears throat> We've gotten most of the major firms to the point where they were doing it anyway, but now across the board, all firms have to do it in the UK. So we do have data, but people are reluctant to fill it in, asking the questions at the beginning of the journey. But over time, we find that more people respond, and the more pe firms make an effort to create an inclusive environment, do things like you know celebrating Pride Month, having a you know a diversity week where they have LGBT inclusive activities, making sure they have an LGBT network, having kind of that visibility. From the leadership those response rates go up over time and that's always been true in the organizations that i've worked in and that just gives you a snapshot of where you're at mm -hmm. um but i think you know one of the things we're focusing a lot of our work on is not just on who's there but one of the things we know is there's not enough representation at the top so firms in the uk have gotten much better at recruiting so you know the firm I, where i started simmons and simmons where i started interlaw by the time i left um we had out of i think 40 trainees um, lawyers, uh, 12 of them were LGBT because mm -hmm. we got that reputation. But you know, my concern was, well, what's the pipeline? Are those people going to make it to make it up? So I think there's a lot of focus not just on making sure that people are visible and they're there, but that we're providing support to them through their careers, mm -hmm. throughout their careers. Well, take for example the Dodd Frank Act that was recently passed into law. Section 342 <coughs> um, asks uh, demographics for diversity to go to the Office of Minorities and Women. Um, there are several um, Federal Reserve Banks that are voluntarily including LGBT on it, and while it's not expressed as LGBT inclusive, people will report on it, and I think LGBT is just becoming a larger part of that, falling under the diversity umbrella here and there. Sure. Now, if you look at the data from, from organizations since, such as uh, the Institute for Inclusion in the Legal Profession and others, uh, it shows that a higher percentage of LGBT lawyers are in large firms, and the data on higher salaries also su suggests that the larger firms, uh, that there are more LGBT lawyers at least identified. And so do you feel that successful LGBT lawyers tend to come out after achieving success and stability in their career, or that larger firms tend to be more progressive and are committed to employing more LGBT uh, lawyers? Yeah. Okay, well I think, you know, from a, from um, a, U a UK perspective, from, you know, from what we see in the UK, you you see, I, there there are more there are more out lawyers at larger firms. I think it's not that there are more LGBT lawyers at larger firms. I just think there are environments where they feel more comfortable to be out because they have more support around them. But I actually think there are even more of them that are in house. So if you look at especially the senior levels, you'll see that those um, you'll see that a lot of LGBT people have gone in house the same way. Ethnic minority women. There seem to be more inclusive environments in the UK um, outside of law firms and in corporates or financial institutions 
Um, so that's certainly the trend that we see as far as getting people comfortable with coming out. I think a lot of people from the older generation did come out after they were successful. So some of the studies we've done, we did a study in 2009 with the Law Society on LGBT solicitors, and one of the things we found was that people came out after they had reached partnership, and many of them commented, I never would have made partnership had I been out my whole career. And in fact, some of them wanted to go on to say, good luck to all these young guys who are out, because they're never gonna make it to the top or I, they worry about them. I mean, it wasn't really meant to be nasty, it was just meant to be a bit of a warning and a bit of a concern. So they, I think that, you know, as I alluded to that earlier, that pipeline issue is something that I think is, is, is a real concern because the, the young lawyers are out now. Um, I don't think we spend a lot of time helping them come out. I'm just really worried that they're there, that we continue seeing that progress. And when, in that, when we did the 2009 report, the Law Society did three reports, one on gender and one on ethnic minorities. They called them the Barriers Reports and published them together and Interlaw co-authored the LGB one. Um, but <clears throat> what I think really concerned me was looking at the women's report and the fact that people thought over 15 years ago when we started equally recruiting women into law firms, um, they thought, oh great, we're gonna step back and in 15 years we're gonna have all these female partners and this whole problem's now been solved. And we've really found out that we have a real issue, not just around a leaky pipeline, but actually some data from like the, from the 30% club has shown that you see the leaky pipeline is men and women leaving in equal numbers, law firms, but actually the real problem for women is promotion because of those that stay behind, men are um, more likely to make it to partners. So one of the statistics from the 30% club study was that um, when a man and a woman start at a law firm as trainees, the male candidate, the male candidate who started is 10 times more likely to make partner in a law firm than the female who started on the same day. So these sorts of statistics are things that are very worrisome, and I think it translates over into LGBT where we can say, um, are these people who are different gonna be at that same disadvantage? Well, and LGBT issues are women's issues, and women issues are LGBT yeah. issues, and that, you know, lesbians are women's and be lesbians. I think, you know, it, it, there's, it, the, the bottom line is this. We had an African American president of the Washington D.C. Bar Association, and he would he would go out speaking about being out and, and proud and gay. He said, "Of course, I didn't tell um, my firm when they were hiring me that I was gay. I was one of their first African American hires." <laughs> you know, so you you kind of have to you know chisel this off as you go forward. Sure, and I think that's and 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 that that cross strand, and that's I think more and more of the work we're doing in interlaw is focusing across the strands because within the LGBT community we do have everyone. You can be every other strand and be <laughs> LGBT. It's one aspect of who you are. And, and the work and the research that we've done has really shown that you're really in an in-group or you're in an out-group. And when I looked at those three studies the Law Society did, I read all three of them and thought, well, I don't really, I mean, the stories were told in different ways, but I saw similar experiences across the board. So we did the follow-up report in 2012 on career progression. We surveyed over 2,000 people in the legal sector, and we didn't just do LGBT. We did all the strands because we wanted a full picture of what the profession looked like. And we really did see, it was very stark, the findings. And it was essentially, you're in the in-group or you're in the out-group. And the findings were, if you were straight, white, male, and elite educated, um, then you earned the most money and you were the most satisfied and thought things were the fairest within your job. And the more you diverge from that, the less you earn and the less fair things you think you think things are. And that rule generally held true. Um, there's a couple exceptions to that, but it was, it was pretty stark findings and that was published in 2012. And that's really formed the foundation of a lot of our work, which is about making sure that we're being inclusive within the profession for everyone, and that we're really creating meritocracies, we're looking at the cultures we're in, we're challenging the decisions that managers are making around promotion, advancement, work allocation. Those are really, to me, the nuts and bolts of equality work. Sure. And you both met, mentioned something about different generations, and is there a difference between the generations of LGBT lawyers? Absolutely. We still have some older gentlemen who for years and years and years have been bringing the same people or the same other fellow to the <clears throat> annual holiday party and, and still may not come out. I mean, one of the hardest things about coming out is coming out yourself and really being able to adapt that identity and being able to talk about it. And so, um, you know, I, I think it's going to continue to be a problem for older generations. And, um, you know, the younger generation comes out early and earlier all the time. And we're kind of in the middle of that, aren't we? When we look, you know, because when we did our study in 2009, we really saw that the divide was kind of 40 and up and 40 and under. 
So now I'd say, you know, it's 45 and up and 45 and under. And there was this, a total, this is in the UK, and there's a total different approach to sexual orientation. People truly believed that your sexual orientation was a private matter. It was not something you discussed at work. You did not fill out monitoring forms. You did not bring that part of you to the office. We're very much the younger generation is completely open, has a completely different approach. And, and they don't want to go to the office. They want to work in fuzzy slippers <laughs> in the middle of the night on the laptop. <laughs> so. Yeah, and, and you know, we've, we've, you know, we've done, and what, so some of the work, like when I was talking about monitoring, it's convincing some of the older management, and it's not just about older LGBT people, it's older people across the board. Okay. You know, we're having this problem with the judiciary in the UK. They didn't want to monitor we started working with the Judicial Appointments Commission, and I was told that within my lifetime they would never monitor sexual orientation because the senior judges thought it was an inappropriate thing to ask, it was an inappropriate question. Well, you know, after doing a, we did a report on the judiciary and um, barriers to entry for LGBT lawyers, and um, we're doing that research and working with the J Judicial Appointments Commission, they now do monitor, so it didn't take a lifetime, it took four years. But what it took was a change in leadership and somebody who was very enlightened with an HR background um, um, taking over the JAC and basically coming in and saying we're going to change this but still at the higher levels it's a challenge and so even some of the older straight men would say well we're, we shouldn't be asking people this mm -hmm. and you have to explain to them the dangers of not asking because mm -hmm. you're sending a message out by not having that question there. Good, thank you. Darcy, you mentioned the uh, Lavender Law Conference and what a smashing success it's been in the U.S. And I understand you're now going to expand into the UK. Yay! And yes. so, <laughs> will it be different? How will it be different? And do you intend to expand into other countries as well? Um, I, the going to London was really because of our relationship with Daniel, and we had an opportunity to bring um, what we call our Out and Proud um, Award. Um, in that instance, we recognize somebody within a legal department for being out and proud. It's very simple. They're getting recognition because of simply who they are. Um, and it helps us with law firms because we feel a lot of time the legal professional suppliers are wringing their hands. What are we going to do? They're going to find out we're gay and we have gay lawyers here. And what well, the client is gay as well. And it's not as big of a worry. And so um, starting at Minority Corporate Counsel Association's Pathways to Diversity, we started recognizing people within the legal departments. And because Mr. Tim Hales had been um, known to Daniel, we were able to give him the first recognition two years ago. Um, last year, it was Dan Fitz, who's a former president of the Association of Corporate Counsel here in the US. And we were able to recognize them. And so now we're expanding our programming. We'll be doing educational programming and some work with law students over there. So we're absolutely delighted to be working with um, Inchilaw and um, bringing something new over there. And if we have a relationship with another great leader, natural leader like Daniel is, we'd love to bring it somewhere else. I'm very excited about having, you know, launching a Lavender Law experience in London because I, you know, have been coming over um, to, to Lavender Law for several years now and I just thought I really want to have this experience available for European lawyers. We're starting in London but we really want it to be, have a European focus. You know, if I'm feeling, if, and people are feeling isolated in London, you know, how about that lawyer working in Hamburg or that lawyer working in Milan? Um, you know, the continent is even more challenging than the, what we experience in London. And the Lavender Law, I mean, it is, you go there and you just walk away feeling so energized. When you walk in that recruiting room and there's, you know, 150 plus employers at these tables just buzzing, mm -hmm. um, meeting law students and candidates, you think this is unbelievable. We have nothing like it in, in the UK. So I think to bring that, um, over and work with um, work with the LGB bar and work with Darcy and her fantastic team is really exciting. Um, so and, and I'm hoping it will be another step forward for equality in the, in the UK and well, Europe. And I think the the challenge, of course, is that the firms that support the LGBT bar financially are global firms, um, you know, and uh, people move, <laughs> you know, and um, this is certainly a global issue, and it's becoming more and more of a global issue as we see um, certain countries um, criminalizing um, and, and coming up with all sorts of new laws. Um, so we're excited to go international. Well, thank you. And, and I understand, Daniel, that the Interlaw Diversity Forum's new endeavor in the U.S. Uh, has been the New York launch of the Apollo Project. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. So coming out of the Career Progression Report, our theme really is about cultural change and transformation of organizations um, to not to just not to uh, to benefit all people across all strands of diversity. Um, and really, it's about you know talent management and creating meritocracies. Um, so we wanted to 
give the tools to managers to allow them to bring about change. I think one of the problems we have and one of the things the report really showed us is that we've been having networks for a long time. A lot of kind of the diversity 101, if you will, isn't bringing about that change that we're looking for. If the report we published in 2012 looks like the forward was written by Baroness Scotland, um, who was um, the first black and female attorney general in the UK, and I think the 600 year history of the position, you know, who wrote the forward and said, you know, I've been waiting for things to change, and you know, <laughs> I ain't got much time left, I can't wait another 30 years, things don't look that different from the way they did 20 years ago. We want to figure out how do we unlock and how do we change it. So the Apollo project is, is we're very excited. Um, it's being supported by Baroness Scotland, it's being supported by the Lord Mayor of London. We're collaborating and working with people like the IALP, we're working with the, um, with the LGBT bar. We really want it to be a global project that puts together case studies of how do you actually bring about organizational change. It can be from a wide range of areas, but I think what's different about it is, you know, people win awards or get recognition for particular projects, but you never really see the nuts and bolts of what those projects are or learn how to replicate them. So what we're trying to do is we're doing a global, um, a global call for submissions every six months. We launched at the, um, we did a launch at the House of, um, House of Commons in, in May this year. Um, that was hosted by the Minister for um, Sports, Tourism, and Equalities, Helen Grant, um, and we had a supplement in the Financial Times. Um, and what we're trying to do is have that six-month call and ask people, what are you doing? What was your business case? What are you doing? And show us evidence that it's had an impact or a change in your, within your organization. And we think that really is the future of equality work. It's cross-strand. It's really about talent management. It's speaking to managers in their language, saying this has evidence and there's a business and a bottom line and a benefit to this work. Um, and we just want to continue growing that. The next phase will be launching a more interactive website, launching an app, and as I said, we'll have a continued call for submissions every six months. Well, and in, in, insofar as business is global, even if you're not in a big law firm or an MLA 200 law firm, you know, if you're doing any business work at all within your practice, you're dealing with a global economy now. Um, you know, we have started a new, um, uh, program called We Mean Business that is going to be specific to those relationships because within the law, you know, our relationships is our business and this is business of relationships. Um, and so we're excited about the We Mean Business kind of a motto because I think it gives everybody an idea of what um, diversity is at its best. It's bringing together people within a work construct for that kind of networking and professional development and advancement. Um, you know, uh, the business case for diversity is something that is a buzz phrase that you'll hear about time and time again. Um, the Institute for Inclusion in the Legal Profession is certainly the thought leader in this area and has a great product that I recommend to everyone, everywhere I go, to test the, 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 the business case for diversity. But ultimately, I, I, I do think that, at least at Lavender Law and at our annual conference of the LGBT Bar, we find that when we can bring that client together with a legal professional who's going to be giving them excellent service, within a construct of we understand each other culturally, we know what our families are like, we know what our coming out stories are, we know that that's just a success story. And bringing that nationally and internationally is really what the We Mean Business program is gonna be all about. Yeah, and you know, at my firm at CMS, you know, we've done a survey of our clients because rather than create our diversity program in a vacuum, we went out to our clients and said, what is it that you're looking for from a law firm? What do you like of what we've done? What more would you? Be, what more do you want? Who who do you admire within the legal profession? Who do you think is a leader in doing good work? Um, and also, we also asked them about decision making on um, on work allocation, and the results were really really informative. And one thing that came up again and again was this idea of sharing values in a culture. Mm -hmm. um, in-house counsel are under more and more pressure around spend. Mm -hmm. They are tightening up their legal panels and they're truly looking for partners. And they're saying, look, we view our external counsel from our firms as part of my team. I don't have time to brief you and tell you what my culture is and how my culture works. You just need to get it. Mm -hmm. And you're either on board or you're not. Um, and so I think that's a really powerful message that we're hearing from our clients, which is we really need, law firms need to be aligning with the, with the culture of their clients, doing that extra work to really truly get to know them on an individual, but also on a corporate culture level. And you, you and your firm have been very involved in something called Purple Ring. Can you tell us about that? Um, yes, so um, actually CMS um, it, uh, started a project where we were looking at the same issue around pipeline and how do we highlight senior women um, it's something that you know the profession is grappling with. It's really important to us. 
as a firm, we have really high numbers of female partners. We're um, over 30% female partners, but we don't have enough women partners at the top end, although we do have a lot of managers. Um, and we are we have re recently elected our a new senior partner, um, Penelope Warren, and we're it's fantastic to have her kind of chairing our board and, and leading, and it's, it's very rare for a global firm to have a female chair. Um, but what we did with a project called the Athena Project is we collaborated with an artist called Leonora Saunders, who took portraits of senior women in our firm, um, in the government, and also in our clients. And, and we matched those portraits with um, profiles that were written about them. And we've taken these portraits, and they're six foot by four foot, and we replaced all the artwork on our top meeting room floor with these incredible portraits of women, and they're very powerful images. And so people really come into the building and go, whoa. You know, you're used to seeing, you know, let's face it, either horses jumping over fences, or like old white guys like painted in like gilded frames. And people come in and they go, wow, this is really different. And our staff has really responded as well, and you know, the young women, and we, we not only have been given, had a client events around it, we've also brought in our CSR partners and brought in young women from schools and young men from um, all around London to give them a tour, and it's really about raising those aspirations, and it's been so successful um, that we wanted to replicate it for LGBT and take it global and make it Interlaw. So um, Interlaw has launched a, a, a project that came out of it called Purple Rain. So we're working with a photographer called Thomas Knights. Thomas is in New York now launching his exhibition. He's done a lot of work around um, rebranding the ginger male, okay. who is who is a, it's a very discriminated against group in the UK. Um, so um, Thomas has taken these incredible portraits of, of redheaded men and they are just gorgeous. And so Thomas is this amazing photographer. The exhibition launched, he's a book that came out called Red Hot 100. So Thomas is a, is a friend of mine and we talked about collaborating to work on this. So with Purple Rain, we are looking at LGBT and straight ally role models. We started taking a picture. Our first portrait was of the Lord Mayor of London, Fiona Wolfe the 686th Lord Mayor, the second female, who's a huge straight ally, and this gorgeous photo of her in Mansion House, basically in a throne in her ermine robes, <laughs> kind of in this room called the Egyptian Room. And we've done portraits of everything from um, a, there's an amazing portrait of, um, of a woman who is the captain of the seated volleyball team for, for Team GB um, for the Paralympics, and we took a picture of her in the Olympic Park. She's an open lesbian. It's this amazing photo of her um, in front of the Paralympic, the sculpture of the Paralympic symbol with a volleyball in the air. So it's a whole range of them. We have a fabulous one of a transgendered um, criminal lawyer, Mia Yamamoto, who's truly a leader in her field and just a gorgeous woman. Um, so it's a whole range. We're going to be doing a New York exhibition down the road. But again, and we're, we're working with Lisa Power, who is the um, one of the founders of Stonewall. And she worked for the Terrence Higgins Trust um, as their head of policy. She's one of the leading activists for HIV and AIDS in the world. And Lisa's going to be writing our profile. So we're really excited about Purple Rain, and we think it has a lot of power. So we'll be doing a New York exhibition down the road, another exhibition next year in London. So it's a really exciting project. I'm gushing. I'm going on too much. <laughs> sounds great. We look forward to it. It sounds fantastic. And, and for, for you, Darcy, what can be done to foster closer closer collaboration and support between advocates for LGBT lawyers and those for straight women, uh, racial and ethnic minorities, and mm -hmm. those with disabilities? You know, we build community very slowly. It's not the kind of thing where you just snap your fingers and, uh, you know, as a nonprofit, you can suddenly say, well, we've got all these resources here and there. Um, to say that the LGBT community is led by older white gentlemen is just a true fact. And as a woman executive director of a, of a nonprofit, I'm here to tell you it's, we're just part of the rest of society. Um, and so what we do is we make it a priority within the LGBT bar um, to work where uh, the, the work is needed. For instance, the last four years, or is it five years now, we've gone to Old Miss Law School which you can't get there from here. <laughs> you actually have to fly in two hours away and then drive either up from Jackson or down from Nashville. Uh, but we make it a priority to go to Ole Miss and uh, do uh, all day 
CLE, the Dean of the Law School, teaches LGBT tax issues, which are fascinating and even more fascinating after the Windsor decision. I never thought I'd say that about tax law. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but we do family law there. We've got a family law institute that's a national program. Um, and that encompasses all of our families. You know, We have a lot of LGBT families within Mississippi. And where they live primarily is along the Delta, which is the poorest region of Mississippi. Um, so while we're heavily supported by these huge global law firms that are so generous and are supportive of our work, um, we're still bringing it all back to the community. Um, we just had our first um, African American president uh, come up through our organization, and it just changes expectations of what we're going to be doing um, on different issues and, and with different um, effects. Um, for instance, one of the programs we're working on is the so-called gay panic criminal defense. Um, that's an instance in which um, some people might be familiar with it because of the Matthew Shepard murder in which a criminal defendant would say, I just so freaked out that they were gay and they made a pass at me that I assaulted them or murdered them or whatever it would be. It's hard to believe that you could use any other individual identity component and, and still get away with that. Um, we see it all the time and we've got a case coming up in Mississippi in which a, a young man was murdered. Um, he. Um, like Trayvon Martin was the only son, uh, the only child and the only son uh, within his family. He was the first openly gay Democratic candidate for mayoral office, uh, any office in Mississippi, but mayoral office of um, Clarksdale, Mississippi, and was murdered. And uh, we're, we'll see that coming to trial shortly. And um, by all indicators of the press reports, they're going to be using that gay panic. Uh, defense. Um, so when we work on our issues within the LGBT construct, you don't make that issue be a white issue or a black issue or women's issues or men's issues. It's, it's really just um, the LGBT family. Um, one area of, of importance um, that we really want to try to get people focused on is marriage becomes less and less of a national issue here in the U.S. and people are saying what is going to be next. Um, out of homeless youth in the United States, a full 40 percent are LGBT youth. I mean, we just have um, truly a, a, a holocaust, if you pardon the expression, or an epidemic maybe of, of homeless youth who are couch surfing, as they call it, and putting themselves in very, very precarious situations, both physically, uh, mentally, spiritually, trying to get through because they can't go home uh, as LGBT youth. And so our, our work and our campaigns are not specific. Um, granted, once you get to big law, I think there's strata like, with classes and and you get a lot more hierarchy, but um, our social justice campaigns, of course, affect everybody, and we work heavily on it with uh, Hispanic National Bar, for instance, on the murder that occurred in Puerto Rico, or um, work very well with the National Asian Pacific American Bar, sharing resources and ideas. You've mentioned that you're the executive director of a nonprofit or a charitable organization in the UK, uh, would be the equivalent, and in other diversity efforts, as the issue becomes better known, uh, commercial enterprises start to infringe or, or try to capitalize. Mm -hmm. And have you seen that in the U.S. in terms of LGBT and the law? Oh yeah, we're not just seeing it in the U.S., but we see it in London, we see it in Hong Kong, um, where for-profit organizations are going to be trying to um, do diversity work. It's not our model um, as an LGBT bar association. Our model is to build community. Um, for instance, within our own organization, we have a corporate counsel institute where it's by, for, and about those within the legal departments. Um, we have our first ever financial institute gathered a week and a half ago in New York. Um, and so we're trying to find those certain subsets of the demographics in which we can build community within our groups. Um, this is a much different model than say somebody who's trying to pick up diversity contracts as a for-profit business. Sure. And, and you've mentioned a couple of times, Daniel, the uh, career progression report in the 2012 a couple of questions on that. How was it received in the UK? And then is there plans to update it and continue to uh, see what the career progression looks like? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I think, as I said, I think uh, a lot of the work we're doing now has come out of the career progression report, the Apollo project, and gathering that kind of collective intelligence and putting that best practice out there for everyone really is a response to the, to the career progression report, which really had a call for change. We said law firms should implement targets. We said law firms need to monitor and look at their culture, look at social mobility, and look at management training. Um, so Apollo really supports the outcomes of that. We've actually seen law firms adapting Target. So we suggested it. We thought it was pretty racy to put it out there. And now a lot of law firms, particularly around gender, have been announcing and saying we would like 
25% female partnership by 2018. They're putting numbers on it, they're announcing it. Um, we've seen corporates doing the same. Lloyd's, um, Lloyd's Banking Group has done that. Um, so I think that's a really exciting movement forward. I think the report's been really well received. People within the community have said that it's the right, a good report because it asks the right questions. So I think certainly updating the report, we're doing, um, we're doing a subset report with using the data. There's so much data that we gathered doing this that the actual report that was published is just sort of an overview. So we're doing a, a much deeper report on gender, which is being published later this year. We're looking to do an LGBT follow-up as well um, and doing some additional roundtables and looking at that data because the findings for LGBT were interesting. Um, we saw the LGBT group was very high performing within this. We'd like to explore that a bit deeper and find out um, what else is there and it's a little bit different from the results of our study we did in 2009 um, and definitely updating as well and maybe looking at working with other organizations and going beyond the legal sector because there's obviously an overlap within the legal sector and other sectors because all the uh, organizations have law um, have legal staff within them so mm -hmm. we've been talking to people in some of the other sectors like um, oil and gas mm -hmm. um, looking at finance and maybe talking about how we can work with them well, and look, businesses know that diversity improves the bottom line. It's just a fact. It's what they know to be true. And I think that oftentimes businesses are frustrated when they go to some of the most prestigious firms in the world and find a very narrow slice of the human experience. Um, you know, we're not putting widgets on cars. Um, what we're trying to do is come up with a group of people to solve complex and, and very you know, hairy problems that exist within a, a, a business's construct. And so I think it's really important that somehow or another we get through to the legal profession, that if they expect to continue to be, you know, someone to go to and pay, uh, you know, these, these prices um, for uh, legal professional services, that those businesses do want to see the diversity there because they know it's just a smarter way to work. And it's interesting because you see people ask the question and say, well, aren't you concerned that by doing the work that you're doing, you're somehow you know, over-promoting LGBT people or you're advancing them too far? And you know, I always say it's interesting that people ask that question, are they worried about the work you're doing on gender? Too many, is, are we gonna have too many women? Are we pushing women forward who aren't ready? And I say, well, you know, if you believe that talent's distributed equally among all people, and you have a partnership that's 80 or 90% men, I'd be worried about having untalented men around the table because statistically speaking you do not have the best people <laughs> because where are all these female candidates particularly when law firms have been recruiting 50 percent women for 15 years where have all those talented women gone and you know we can see them because they're general counsels they're managing directors or that tell us <laughs> yeah and that talent has often left the organization so i do you know challenge people to flip that around and say it really is about if you believe the talent is equally distributed you should be having a diverse workforce because you want to have the best so it really is about creating an inclusive workforce where it really, you know, hopefully all these things come off the table and it's just about dealing with people as individuals. And until we see more diversity at the top of the profession, we'll know that we're not there yet. We don't have those meritocracies. And those meritocracies deliver better results. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we did studies within our firm where we looked at different departments and, and where, we, where we had better managerial practices, better flexible working practices, better work allocation. We have increased profitability. So for us at CMS, it's a business initiative and imperative to get that right. And I think that's true across the board. Well, on behalf of the Chicago Bar Association, I'd like to thank Darcy Chemnitz and Daniel Winterfeld for a very uh, interesting and, and uh, uh, great discussion on LGBT and the law in the US and the UK. Well, thank you. Great. Thank, thank you, you so much, much for having us. Thank you.